Until 1985, the Indian Act removed the rights of women with Indian status if they married someone without status. Indigenous women began to bring cases against the Indian Act to eliminate sex-based inequities in the Indian Act and to restore their uh, status rights. These women included Jeanette Corbière Lavelle, who describes to rise up her long struggle to regain her status under the Indian Act. Although finally successful in winning her status rights, Jeanette also discusses the ongoing problems for the children of Indigenous women after two generations of intermarriage with non-status partners that results in the, the difficulty of transferring status to those children. Good morning, Jeanette. Um, and we're here today to do an interview about this incredible struggle that you and many others, other women had uh, to win your claims for status rights for Indians. And um, first of all, I want to say, uh, my name is Sue Colley, and I'm with the Rise Up Feminist Digital Archive Collective. And um, we are, as you know, recording the history of the women's movement, um, every part of the women's movement from 1970 till 1998, roughly. Um, so. Good morning to you. And uh, yeah, and I want to say miigwech for the invitation to be part of this uh, initiative. I think it's worthwhile and uh, I'm, uh, I, I know it'll be good. So miigwech. Miigwech. Oh, kamach tamer. Ani. Bojo. Kiwit nang dijnikas, nishnabe kwendao. Nidom nising dojba. Neither should jiba much time go ke nama bungi. Jemnado. Gadabuga send me go we, not my young, not a mushnang number. When it chicky down, chicketuang when it chit but the mong man again, you got a show if there, you just want the Asia book of send the bag any. How miguach and the dog miguach. Just giving thanks to the creator as part of our teachings when we're starting anything to give thanks to uh, the creator and uh, just for everything we have been given because. Uh, it is all here for our uh, benefit and for us to share and to maintain for our future generations to come. So this is what uh, my grandparents, and especially my grandmother, has always insisted and, uh, you know, just encouraged us to do so. I believe it's a good way to start our conversation. That's very nice. Yes. Okay. It probably would be really nice if we had a translation, so we could we we could um, educate people about what you're saying, right? Definitely. We can talk about I, that afterwards if you want. Well, I I could do it now. Um, what I have just said is, uh, my Nishnabe name is North Star, which is Kiwedna given to me many, many years ago by a chief, a Delaware chief when I was only in my 20s. And at the time, I didn't realize that he went down as in the Shnabe when, but he was Delaware, but we are all uh, in this part of our territory here in uh, North America or Turtle Island as we uh, refer to the land that we're living here and um at the time as i said i was only in my 20s i had newly arrived in toronto and uh, it was at a function that i had been asked to attend and uh, i now when i look back and this is what 60 years later almost 
I realized the significance of that name because my younger son, who works now in Mozambique, he works for the UN. Oh, and he wow. said, yeah, and he said, mom, he said, do you realize uh, your Nishnabe name, Giwednang, North Star? It's the light, eh? the center point of the universe, the guiding light. And so what you have done is been that star, that light to guide many of the women to what uh, our destination is, is to that uh, role within our communities, within our homes, and generally within our uh, place in society to be that uh, focal point, to be that center, and to assist and to uh, and to bring people back to that understanding that this is who we are. We are women and uh, we are the caregivers and we are the ones who bring life into the world. So, and I, and this is my youngest son who said this and I thought, that's right, it's so significant. And I appreciate it now more than I did at the time because this would have been in the, 60s and at the time we weren't talking about uh being uh proud of who we are our uniqueness and our tradition and our backgrounds you know in very many places many of us and many of our people would deny having that indigenous heritage so it's uh it, it's i, I guess realizing that uh, and our teachers say this you know our elders that uh, we all have a role to play when we come into this uh, world and having a name that uh, will challenge us and will be significant is one of our teachings and so uh, being given this name uh, gave me that challenge and inevitably i had to do it so um, did your parents know what the meaning of the, of the name when they gave it to you? Well, they knew what it meant in the when, which is North Star, but didn't really follow through on the meaning. Other than this was in the 60s and uh, right across Canada, we were just starting to uh, revitalize uh, our culture and our traditions and make it more a uh, part of our daily living. So that was the, the significance, I believe. And so when we start each day, uh, I've been um, advised that the first thing you do is you acknowledge the creator, you give thanks. And that's what I said, miigwech em nadal, mandakisha kaminova minya. Thank you for giving us another day. And uh, thank you for all the beauty and the goodness that is here for our youth. And I also said, um, we will do our best to preserve and to protect all those resources. I didn't really do the long version. I just did it quickly, but usually we will say miigwech uh, for the water, the land, the birds, the animals, all animals. And it's, uh, it's really uh, grounding, I guess, to, to be able to do that because it makes you realize uh, how insignificant we are when we consider the rest of the environment around us and our responsibility to maintain the environment and the whole ecosystem for not only our children and grandchildren, but all the future generations to come. So that was my opening prayer. Yeah. One, and it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Thank oh, you. Thank you much. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, that's my Anishinaabe name, but uh, I was uh, given Jeanette uh, Vivian as my Christian name. And then my maiden name is Corvier, and my married name is Laval. So, and I'm, I'm from the 
with Quemicong unceded territory, which is on Manitoulin Island, situated in the big waters of Georgian Bay. So, miigwech. Thank you. Um, right, well now, it, that's a very good background to what brought you to take on this enormous struggle, I think. So maybe you could tell us a bit about how that happened. Um, I know that you left your um, reserve, right, in 1970. And um, perhaps you could take the story from there. Okay. Actually, 1970 is the year I uh, challenged the Indian Act and uh, challenged in the court system. But I left the reserve when I was uh, 18, 19 and came to Toronto uh, just because, uh, as, as you know, many of our reserves and communities, we don't have any uh, places of employment. So I had finished high school, had a business uh, certificate and went to Toronto and Indian Affairs gave me, uh, or didn't give me, they helped me uh, find a job downtown Toronto in an insurance firm. And I worked there for a year. So this was uh, my introduction to the big city life. Mm -hmm. I didn't care for, this would have been in 1962, I guess. I didn't care for working in an office, so I quit that and got some more uh, education and training. And then I uh, worked at the Indian Friendship Center in Toronto, which was on Church Street at the time. And I would have been about 20 then, I guess. And because uh, we didn't have, or the organization, the Indian Friendship Center, was called the Toronto Indian Friendship Center, didn't have much uh, money for specialized workers. Uh, I was trained to do court work and work with our people who were getting in difficulty with the justice system. So I became the court worker and uh, following that I ended up being the youth worker. Working with our young people who were coming into the city of Toronto, they were coming from all over and uh, all over Ontario mostly. So we had our group. And then I met uh, some other Nishinaabe people and we formed an organization called Nishinaabe Institute, which was uh, an educational organization to look at uh, education and also our own culture and see how we could bring uh, both together to make it more relevant and meaningful. So, Within the Anishinaabe Institute, uh, my own awareness and knowledge of uh, systems, especially government, increased. And then I realized that there are uh, such protections as uh, human rights. We had the Canadian human rights uh, legislation in place and then looking at other, uh, other legislation than the Indian Act. And once realizing all these uh, pieces of legislation and laws that were governing us, of course, growing up on the reserve, you realize how limited everything had to go through the Indian agent. And uh, I remember, uh, well, I'll tell you my story first, but I was just gonna relate the little story about my mother and her uh, confrontation with our local Indian agent but uh, it, it's just I guess thinking back to those days of being under the control of the Indian Act and right down through the Indian agent who had the utmost authority and control over us as as uh, members of our reserve because at the time the Indian Act said that we weren't considered persons, we weren't Canadians, we were uh, members of a band and the band was under the control of the Indian Act. This is just a little story just to show you how ridiculous it is. She was uh, 
an entrepreneur. She had a little store that she was running. She also had a couple of school buses. She was a go getter. Between her and my dad, they were always well providing for the family. I'm the oldest in my family, and I have uh, two brothers and a sister. So I was working, and uh, in the fall or in the summer, my mom and my dad uh, had little piglets that they uh, were given or they purchased and they fed them. So in the fall, they wanted to get some money for uh, other things, Christmas coming. So my mother heard that uh, in the next uh, little white town close to us that uh, the local butchers would buy these little piglets for $25 each. And so that was going to be like uh, $150 there. And so, but in order to sell them, she had to go to the Indian age. And so she went in there and said, you know, I need permission to sell these little piglets. And he looked at her and he said, no, uh, I'm not signing that. He says, I will buy them from you. And so you can get some money. And she said, well, how much are you going to give me? And he said, I'll give you $25. Five dollars for each piglet, and of course she was devastated, you know. And being stubborn and being a woman, she said, "No, I'm taking them all back home," and that's what she did. But uh, she, in turn, just sold them privately. But goes to show you what we had to deal with on a regular basis with these white uh, Indian agents. But that's the story of what we had to deal with every day, like living on the reserve. And not too long before that, you, in order to leave the reserve, you had to get permission from the Indian agent to leave the reserve. But that was a few years uh, earlier. But, but uh, coming to Toronto then and uh, working in the Friendship Center and learning about, uh, you know, what other Canadians were entitled to, of course we, didn't vote well, we weren't uh, eligible until, uh, we weren't used to it because we never did on the reserve, like vote in Canadian elections or get involved in politics. Yeah. And coming to uh, the Indian Friendship Center, when I was the youth worker, we had uh, coffee houses and music and bringing young people together. And that's where I met my husband, David, David Laval. And he's a Canadian, non-Indigenous, and a musician. And he's tall, good-looking, and uh, had curly hair, blue eyes. So uh, after a while, we uh, were married in 1970, April 11, 1970. And then after that, a couple of weeks la later, I received this letter in the mail. And it said, Jeanette Corbier, you are no longer a member of uh, the Wequemekong Unseated Reserve. Here is a check for $35. That's it. And I was, I knew because my cousins had been in the same situation, but I didn't, no one ever challenged it. No one even thought about changing that. We just took it. Eh? That's usually what happens. So when I got this letter, David and I were looking at it and I said, I don't, feel good about this. It's uh, like, this is my community. This is the only family, relatives, community I've ever known. I grew up in Wicomekong. I never went anywhere else, didn't do much traveling even. So I said, how could I not be part of that? And I also realized that if anyone uh, complained or even if the Indian agent said, you're no longer able to come to the reserve, then I would have been charged with trespassing, even going home. So that was a big barrier. And uh, David and I talked about it and I had met Clayton Ruby because he was uh, just a young lawyer coming up at the time. And he had put out this little booklet called La 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 for young people, you know, and their rights. And we had talked about this at the Friendship Center, talking about young people, this, these are your rights. If you get confronted on the street, you know, just refer to this and just state, you know, what you know and what your rights are. And thanks to Clayton, we were aware of that. 
And so this was on uh, Wednesday, Thursday evening. David and I called up Clayton I, and I said, can I talk to you about something? And he said, Clayton said, sure, come over. So we went over to his office Thursday evening and explained, I said, look at this letter. I said, the Indian Act, then he referred to the Indian Act. And it says under section 121B, if an Indian woman marries a non-Indigenous, I think it's a non-Indian man, or a, a man with no status, then she automatically uh, loses her right to status and membership in her community as well. That was section 121B. Didn't apply to men, just to women. Or if, uh, yeah, so it also said, if you married an Indian man who didn't have status, you automatically also lost your uh, status rights. So he looked at it and he said, this isn't right, you know, because only affects women. He says, it's obviously discriminatory. And he says, under the Canadian Bill of Rights, we could challenge this. And then he read further on, he says, Jeanette, if you want to do something about this, you have to do it tomorrow, next day. And so David and I looked and he says, do it, you know, because this is important. So Clayton filed the appeal on that Friday at the very last day that he could have done so, we could have done so. And that started the whole uh, ball rolling, I guess you would say. Oh, how did you meet Clayton, by the way? Well, he came to the Friendship Center with my youth group and spoke to the young people and brought his little booklets. Because right. he was just a young lawyer just getting out and uh, getting in the media as well. And I called him up and he came. Right. Us, I, yeah. We've I been met, friends ever since, you know. Yeah. 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 And I met him in 1971 also. Oh. And he and um, he hired me to go with him to the Kingston Penitentiary, mm -hmm. where he was investigating the riots. And so I had to go and take notes and do all of that. So, I, yeah, I got to know him quite well. <laughs> it was good. Yeah. Anyway. Um, all right. So you're in Toronto and you go to Clay and you and David decide you've got to do it and you get the application in on just under the wire. Exactly. And, um, okay, so what happened? Well, being very naive, I figured, uh, like with uh, Clay, Clayton, and uh, he said, well, we have to take it to court, you know, the first thing. So he challenged it, and we went to the county court, the very first court. And I uh, naively thought, well, the judge is going to see this. It's very discriminatory. And... Uh, it was Judge Grossberg at the time and uh, went into this big courtroom on University Avenue. And we were sitting there, Clayton was there and he presented his argument, obviously discriminatory because it's only women, uh, Indian women who were getting uh, exclusive marriage. And uh, Judge Grossberg didn't see it that way. He said, well, sounds to me like, uh, and he was looking at me, it sounds to me like, uh, you want to have your cake and eat it too. And I didn't understand what he meant, but, uh, and then further on, okay. oh, doctor here. And further on, he uh, said, well, we know uh, what uh, Indian women are like, and you should be glad a white man married you, is what he said to me in the court. And I was devastated that. You know, I think Clayton was too taken aback, you know. This was in a court of law that he said this. And I I couldn't handle it. I just broke down and said, ridiculous. And Clayton very calmly said, don't worry, this is just the first step. And so went on to appeal again. And then it went to the Federal Court of Appeal, which was the three judges. And very quickly and calmly said, obviously discriminatory section 121B should be removed from the Indian Act. And I thought, good, now I'll be able to get my status back. But of course, the Attorney General of Canada didn't see it that way. And Indian Affairs didn't like it that way. And 
Globe and Mail, the Toronto Star, everywhere. And then my own people got into it, the Indian Chiefs, the Union of Ontario Indians, National Indian Brotherhood at the time. They were all opposed and they said, no, this is uh, the way it always has been. This is the Indian Act. And they didn't want to see that particular section removed, even though uh, there had been sections of the Indian Act that had been challenged the one on drinking, for instance. I forget what year that came into being, uh, 59 maybe. But no one questioned that. But they really questioned uh, removing Section 12.1b out of the Indian Act. And then looking at all our leadership within the Indian organizations, as I said, they were uh, the Union of Ontario Indians, the National Indian Brotherhood, and those were the main ones. And many of our chiefs in Ontario, many of them had uh, non-Indigenous wives. And so their wives gained status when they married their Indian husbands. And maybe that was the fear that uh, if I was able to keep my status and uh, that their wives would lose their status maybe that was a consideration i don't know what the reasoning was behind it but anyways they were all opposed to it when we won at the federal court of appeal with three judges yeah. they said uh, it's discriminatory that particular section should be removed from the indian act and there had been some media prior to that you know where it's a indian woman challenges indian act and so that spread right across canada and I would try and go and get support from, I mentioned the Union of Ontario Indians and the National Indian Brotherhood, just to ask them and try and explain. I said, this particular section isn't uh, part of who we are as uh, Indigenous people, as Indian people within our communities, because growing up on a reserve and looking at our community and listening to my grandmothers and aunts and my mom, I realized how strong our women were and in their community and they always were part of that whole community and they were treated with respect and they were, that balance was there. They had their role, the men had their role, and it was all coming together. And I would say this to the chiefs and uh, they didn't like to hear that. And uh, we couldn't get our voices heard. And then other women right across Canada, like I got calls from uh, Jenny Margetts in Alberta and others from um, uh, Manitoba. And then Mary Tuax early from Quebec, this would have been 1970, I guess, when I first started. She contacted me and said, Jeanette, she says, I've been trying to do this for years, but within the Quebec but through uh, getting support just through publicity and trying to bring her story to like, cause she lost her status. And she said, I want to be with my people. She was starting to get elderly. And uh, she said, that's who I am. She says, right now, she says, uh, I can't even go home to be buried, you know, at the end of my life because she didn't have her status. And she said, they bring, uh, the dogs from uh, Westmount or in Montreal, they're buried under reserve, but I can't be. And she said that was her wish. And, uh, you know, it's heartbreaking when you hear some of the stories our women had to go through. And they were contacting me. And then in Thunder Bay, some women called me and they said, we hear your story. Let's try and get together. This would have been in 1972 and uh, no money because we were just individual women right across Canada. So I found some money uh, from my friends in Toronto, the Anishinaabe Institute gave me my passage and I went to Thunder Bay. And uh, by then I had my son, Nimki, he was born. And so I just took him everywhere I went and we went to our meeting in Thunder Bay. We got together about 15, 20 of us as women. And we founded the Ontario Native Women's Association. I was one of the founding members. 
and uh, and right across, and then other provinces set up their own women's organizations at the time. So it's uh, at least it gave us the voice because we were just being blocked, and so. Uh, in 1973, the Native Women's Association Canada had been formed, but believe it or not, when I we first approached them as the Ontario Native Women's Association uh, with this issue, they they wouldn't support us. The woman who was head at the time didn't agree. They didn't agree that this was an issue that they want to look at, and. Uh, 1973, when we went to Ottawa, there was only very few of us who were there supporting me. I was there, I was president of the Ontario Native Women's Association at the time, I had some friends. We had to uh, do our own fundraising, like usual stuff that as women we did. We had bake sales, we had bingos, but we all were able to get enough money to get on trains and we left Toronto, we went to Ottawa and uh, few of us and we had to share our rooms and slept in church basements and uh, oh, the usual, thing. but it was so strong. Uh, the, some of those women to this day are still friends. They were sisters. Many of them have passed on into the spirit world, but just that feeling we're here, we're committed. This is something that's important to us because them being traditional, they knew it. He says, no, our, we're, connected to our communities, our uh, grandmothers, our aunts, and we're doing all these uh, ongoing uh, visits and communicating. And the only difference being that they didn't have status, but that potential, they were, we were denied other things, eh? Like we couldn't live on the reserve, we couldn't get any uh, education uh, funds or no housing, nothing. And that potential of always being challenged and kicked off the reserve was there too. So Supreme Court of Canada, millions of dollars given to the Indian organizations by the federal government. And uh, it, it was, uh, the, you could see it, the irony of saying all the chiefs in the regalia on one side opposing, and they were supporting the government, the attorney general, and the other, uh, the chief of the Six Nations Reserve, he was on the document as well, opposing uh, Section 12.1b being removed. And uh, there was just us, uh, my, my She had gone through uh, the Ontario uh, courts and she had lost there too. So. They put her case with mine. Clayton says, at least we'll have another case to support us as we go to the Supreme Court of Canada. So her case was there and her lawyer. But there was just so few of us went into the Supreme Court, nine judges. And uh, I, my impression was that they were all very elderly men. And uh, most of them, I would say, were 70 and 80 years of age. I'm not saying that. Uh, it, you know, ageism, I'm not going that route, but they just were not listening, not tuning in. The only one was Bor Alaskan, who was from Thunder Bay, and he had just been appointed. And he was the one who was vibrant asking, and I could see that the questions had to do with, well, why is this and why is that, and, you know? And I thought it would work, but his opposition was Richie, who had okay changing the Indian Act, parts of it anyways, when it had to do with liquor, you know, getting access to alcohol. But he totally opposed uh, my whole uh, challenge in Section 12.1b. So uh, time went by and uh, the- uh, the just, just one Oh, okay. Just one thing. Um, you said another case, an, another sister who had lost her case joined you, but yeah, you froze a bit when her when you said her name. So can you just her name is uh, 
Yvonne Bedard. Oh, and yeah, she yeah, was, of course. She was a member of the Six Nations Reserve. And her chief was on the opposition. But uh, her case came with mine to the Supreme Court of Canada. And so her lawyer was there too. So there was the two of us then that were challenging this removal of Section 121B. And unfortunately, we lost by one vote. Uh, Borolaskin had uh, three other judges supporting that this was discriminatory under the Canadian Bill of Rights. And Ritchie had five on his side, so we lost by one vote. It was really sad and disappointing. This was in 1973. And uh, at that point, I had, uh, well, I still believed in justice and I still believed the legislation and the intent of the uh, Bill of Rights and Human Rights. But I also realized the Indian Act and what as Indian people we had been through under the Indian Act right from the beginning eh, under John McDonald. It was always uh, we, we weren't considered people, we weren't considered persons. And that kept coming through all the way, even to our treaties and, you know, disrespecting that those legal documents, you know, within our treaties. And it just continued. So it was really disappointing for me to realize that. And so I went into a different realm for a while and I, raised uh, my son, then I had my daughter, Dawn, Wab Mimi, and my son is Nimki, Forrest, Michael. So my grandmother gave them their Indian names. Nimki is Thunder, and uh, Wab Mimi is White Dove. And then when my youngest son was born, his name is Ashvik, which is Mountain. And this, these are the names that they use. I just introduced you to my daughter who is here. And we all call her Mimi, that's Dove, right? And Nimki, my son, everyone at home on the community knows him, he's Nimki. You know, he's the land-based teacher and he's with the environment and children, students love him because they're learning, eh? and, uh, and he's very outgoing, just like his dad too. Mm -hmm. okay, so, so uh, so then what happened? Well, th this would have been 1973, 74, and things were quiet for a while, but then uh, women said, no, we're not letting this go. So we started little committees speaking out, and we still had the, I was still with the Ontario Native Women's Association. By then we had a different president, and uh, we brought this issue back up to the forefront again and kept talking about it and uh, bringing it up to different organizations, different governments. And right up to the uh, constitution, you know, the great uh, train that came across Canada just before 1982. But prior to that, there had been committees before the Senate standing committees on the Indian Act and stuff like that. But we just weren't getting our voices heard. In the Constitution, we had women from Red Cross Canada. Some of them were joining that train of Indigenous people that went to, to Ottawa. I think they went to Charlottetown first. And uh, trying to say this has to change. So when was this Indigenous train that went across Canada? That would have been prior to the Constitution, so must have been 80, 1980, 81. I, this was during all the consultations on the Constitution. Yes, that was 1984-5, were the consultations. So do you think it was in there? Well, I suppose because it, I thought it was prior to 1982, didn't we get the, Canadian Constitution under Pierre Elliott Trudeau in 1982. Oh yeah, we did. It was, I'm sorry, I can't always get confused. It wasn't actually enacted and didn't take effect until 1985. No, right? that was the right, Canadian, right. It was the, uh, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms came into being in 1985. Yeah, that's right. And, 
And when the Charter of Rights and Freedoms came into uh, being legislation in April 1985, and Section 12.1b then was removed from the Indian Act. And so Indigenous women who had lost their status, uh, like me and Mary Tuax early, then we were able to get our status back. But okay. it wasn't the same level of status, it was a secondary level of status. Once again, we were discriminated against, you know, just not being treated properly, equally. And uh, Mary Tuax early was still alive and she was so happy. She was one of the first ones to get her status back. And she got her, well, she was able to return to a community and that's where she was buried in, on her reserve. So I, I got my status back in 1985 and it was uh, a secondary level. It was 1B something, I forget. But it wasn't the same that I had. The full status would have been uh, 1A, you know, they'll see 1A. Is, is, this the, is this the problem where you, couldn't, you can't pass your status down to your you can pass it to your children, but not your grandchildren. Was that it? That's right. That's right. It was a secondary level of status. Yeah. yeah. So that was uh, what happened in 1985. Okay. Now, in 1985, when you said it was removed from the Indian Act, did this happen automatically, or did somebody bring this up as part of the negotiations, or did you? Well, well see, the prior to that, there had been ongoing consultations with. Uh, yeah with the federal government and Indian Affairs, eh? And they were saying, well, they realize, I guess, that they're gonna to have to revise the Indian Act and change it because there had been ongoing committees and discussions and, you know, the writing was on the wall. They knew that they would have to change it. So the question then is, how will they put all the women and our children and our dis we be how will we be recognized once again they uh, went with uh lower level we didn't have the same rights as the men mm -hmm. so the men could still marry non-indian women and those non-indian women still were given uh indian status but us uh we had our status back secondary our children had a secondary level of status as well and it only went to them and we couldn't pass it on to our uh, grandchildren. Right. And well, so, I, I guess this was part of, in 1982, when they passed the Constitution and the Charter of Rights, they, then the reason it didn't come into operation until 85 was because all the governments had to put in place the necessary changes to make, um, you know, to make the, the, uh, the Charter operable. So I guess it was because of that and your consultations that it was in that period they they just took out they just corrected it because they knew they had to yeah but the constitution came in 1982 that was canadian constitution the charter of rights and freedoms came into being 1985 and that's when all this work they had been doing okay. then was put into legislation yeah. that's when we were able to uh, get our status back 1985 and they had in place all the secondary levels by then and so that was there until uh 89 then when sharon MacGyver challenged it because of her grandchildren eh? and so that was uh bill sc3 sharon MacGyver's case and by then our women's organizations right across canada we had uh, been always talking about this issue because it's important you know we are uh the center of our communities as women and uh you know we're the teachers we're the ones with uh, the role of teaching language and taking care of the lands the water especially uh the whole recognition of protecting our water came through one of our one of my relatives from Wikwemekong, and that's Josephine Mendelman. She's the water walker. And we were always working together, and she was part of the Ontario Native Women's Association. 
So our women really were uh, always constantly there, wouldn't give up, very stubborn. My husband used to say, yeah, but Anishinaabe women are stubborn. They just will not give up. <laughs> and, and it's true, you know, I see it with my uh, grandmothers, all the women in our community. You want something, you work to it and until you get it. Right. Yeah. So you were also the president of the Native Women's Association at some point, weren't you? That's right. Um, when was that and what were the issues at that time? Well, uh, as I said, in the early stages of the Native Women's Association of Canada, they would not support this issue because it was too controversial and all the chiefs, right across, well, most of the chiefs right across Canada would not support us. But, um, and at a period of time through there, then they started changing because our organizations provincially said this is important. So gradually they started uh, to change their the mindset and they started supporting uh, removal uh, section 12.1b out of the Indian Act. And then uh, the whole question of uh, stopping violence against our women that was another issue and that came through the Ontario Native Women's Association and that would have been in 1989. And then once again, we were criticized. That's our dirty laundry, don't bring it out. But our women said, no, we have to talk about, it. we have to make uh, people aware in our services and our governments aware that this is not right and has to be changed. So from there, then we started hearing more about uh, Indigenous women in Vancouver, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. And that whole issue came, came up. And uh, by then, I was an honorary uh, board of uh, directors with the Ontario Native Women. So I had been with the Ontario Native Women all along and uh, not as a board member. So I had the uh, freedom once I retired in, uh, when I turned 65, I was elected president of the Native Women's Association of Canada. That was in 2009 until 2012. And the issue I was able to bring to the government as a resolution by our women was uh, to support the inquiry, National Inquiry on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. So that happened when I was the president. Oh, so, and that was uh, one of the last official positions that I had then really with uh, the Native Women of Canada, but I'm still with the Ontario Native Women's Association. Right. And then more recently, and we're still talking with government right now is uh, Bill S3, which is the Deschano case, which refers to uh, grand grandchildren and great grandchildren being able to keep our status from the women's line because we still have didn't have all those same rights. We still had a lesser degree of status until uh, last fall, last summer, under Bill S3. So now I called my reserve. I have. Uh, uh, 1A, status level 1A, which is the same status that the Indian men have. So finally now we're on the same level of status that uh, all of our people should have. But it's taken all this time and many challenges by, and most, and it's all been our women who've led this because it is important. And what we're saying is this is our tradition of uh, among our people. This is our history. Our uh, people before contact, we had those roles through our teachings, the grandfather's teachings and our moon teachings and our uh, just living together, you know, a way of life. And we call that Nishnabe Ad. So when living that Nishnabe way, we all had our roles and we had to respect them. And those teachings are so important. So only now uh, has that been recognized within legislation that uh, has just come into being. 
still being implemented and we still have to deal with uh, mm -hmm. Minister Miller and say any discrimination that's uh, still there has to be removed. Why should certain people still be discriminated against? Just because they're indigenous or descended from indigenous women. So hopefully that, that is going to happen in the next little while. Well, it should happen. Legislation has been passed. Yeah. Congratulations, actually. Yeah. Well, um, it's taken a long time. Lot. Yeah, and you still have a lot of issues before you, don't you? Oh, for sure, for sure. <laughs> What do you think the major issues facing Indigenous women in today are? I, when I look around, what I see is um, the healing that has to take place within our communities. And that is a result of the residential schools and the legislation that belittled us and took away that uh, way of living of uh, respect and love and uh, kindness towards each other that really uh, was impacted by the residential schools and by the violence and by legislation and just the treatment by non-indian governments and by provincial rules the justice system it's all there and it's still there and that's still our challenge and uh, but on the other hand, when I look and see our young women, they're into uh, universities and they're getting good education. We have lawyers, we have uh, uh, people in the healthcare system, our women, and also now we're realizing the importance of the environment, protecting the environment. And many of our young people, a lot of our uh, women are going into those fields and saying, we have to do something, not just for us as indigenous people, but for all Canadians. So I am really uh, glad to see that happening. And as an example, I look at my daughter right now, and she's been president of the Ontario Native Women's Association for the last 25 years. She was the youngest one to ever get that role. And she's been doing so much uh, good and you know we've advanced from a small little organization we were bankrupt for a while but now we have a budget in the millions you know and, and doing all kinds of really good work and uh, our students are coming from the smaller isolated communities coming into cities and going to uh, the universities and getting that education and right now, uh, my daughter Mimi Don Laval Harvard is uh, head of the Indigenous House of Learning. So we've got all that support there, and that's really developing. At the, uh, it's it's just so beneficial for our young people. They're able to stay in their course of study because we've got that community there, and we have our traditions. We have our own uh, teaching lodges available. And in our communities, as a former educator, I retired from teaching in my community. And the, uh, the irony is my mother was one of the first teachers on my reserve. And I always said, I'm not going to be a teacher. I'm not. But I ended up being a teacher. My aunts were all teachers. And my sister, we all went into the teaching field because traditionally that was our role. We were the first teachers. So it's natural, I guess, that we went into those roles. I was uh, one of the first teachers in our local high school that was built in our community. And I retired from there. I was the art teacher and the business teacher, family studies teacher. And uh, my son now is there and he's the uh, land-based teacher, you know, teaching students uh, out on the environment and about animals and it's just such a good program and it's working so i believe we will be successful and get more young people through the whole education system and able to proceed into other fields like modern technology there's a lot of interest so they're not fumbling around like i'm doing right now with te technology yeah fantastic well that um, that's a very full story. I really appreciate it. 